I want to share something with you that we discovered in Bible study last night, which is really a bombshell to me. But once I got kind of got over the initial shock of it, I'm actually very elated about this because there are too many people who claim to be in Christ who are unwilling to do what they need to do. I have seen that so highlighted in the last couple of months between people who won't show up to the assemblies, make excuses for themselves, even one who I have given to because they said that they wanted to be in ministry for Christ. They came into ministry. I built them literally a place to live. And they can't be bothered to show up because when they first came in, they were in counterfeit Christianity in so-called ministry, doing things by the work of their own hands. And when they discovered that this was an inside job, they like don't know what to do. I don't know. Change their mind. Oh, this is too hard. Kind of like what happened when Jesus was here and he was talking about the bread of life. And people started dropping off saying, this is too hard a teaching. Who can understand it? Like, "Uh, we're out. It's only our eternal life, but, you know, this is too hard. Doesn't show up to the assemblies, doesn't show up to anything. Just completely excuse themselves from, like, all responsibility. It's amazing. God's going to deal with each person. I am not worried about that at all, and he has been really convicting me the last few days that he's got this. And let me tell you something. Someone who shows up and says they're in ministry for him and then bails out of that, oh, my goodness. The judgment that's going to be brought on that person is so intense. How about those who've had an opportunity to work with his shepherds? Those who he brought to his shepherds to be taught, and they, they're like, eh, this is too hard. I'm just going to ghost her after she's been providing free, like, free help to me. I mean, it's the same thing. It, it's not about me. Let me tell you something. I'm not taking that personally, but I am outraged and appalled that people who claim to be in Christ do these things. But it's no different from what was going on when Paul was here and he was being betrayed. No different from Jesus healing people, healing 10, and only one comes back to glorify God. It's sickening. It's so disgusting. So I'm actually rejoicing in what I'm about to share with you because even though we're not worthy of what God's giving us, there is a certain amount of merit that is required. You are supposed to be engaged in this covenant. And it is a lie to say that it is completely without merit. It does not say that in the word. That is not a definition of the word. That's a definition of man. That is an outright lie that many of you are just too comfortable with because you don't want to have to give anything to Christ. And you know what? If that's how you feel, you won't give anything to him and he won't give anything to you. Let me read to you what we discovered last night. I saw thrones on which were seated, excuse me, This is Revelation 20, verse 4. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. So who's he looking at? He's looking at those who have been martyred, period. He's He's looking at those who have been martyred. No one else, no one who continues to remain in counterfeit Christianity, no one who thinks that by the justifications of their own delusions in the world that they're somehow a good Christian, he's saying those who have been martyred. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. That That's it. That is who he has defined is going to reign with Christ for a thousand years. Those who have been martyred. Do you understand that? Like not not my parents... Not my mother who seemed to love God, but she was, you know, remained in counterfeit Christianity. And no one in your family who has not been martyred for Christ. Only the martyrs are going to participate. Only the martyrs are going to share in that first resurrection. Let me clarify. Everyone will rise. Every single person from the beginning until the end of this age are going to rise from their tombs and graves. They will see him, even those who pierced him are going to rise from their tombs and graves, the only ones who will share in the first resurrection will be those who have been martyred. Let's read it again. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. 
this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has, had, has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Now, when the second resurrection happens, certain people will be given an opportunity to be saved, but not as priests of God, not as sons of God. They will be servants. And you see that in Ezekiel 46. If you need to know about that, go to Ezekiel 46 and you're going to see that he distinguishes between sons of God, those who have an inheritance. And, and let me tell you something else. You know, particularly in the Pentecostal tradition, the charismatic tradition, I hear people screaming this out all the time. No weapon that is formed against you will prosper and every tongue that accuses you in judgment will, you will condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Okay. And they call that out to invoke something that they think everybody who says I'm Christian is going to have. But this Revelation 20 is very specific about who the servants of God are, those who've been martyred for him, those who have died to Christ, those who are dead in Christ. And now let me ask you something else. When you're reading scripture and he says, what I whisper in your ear, you call out from the roof. Are you doing that? Do you see people in churches doing that? You see them out there saying what I'm saying, putting their lives and their family's lives on the line to, ha to say the things that I'm saying that tick people off. People are upset about it. Some of you are upset about it and you claim to be in him. Are you doing that? You putting your life on the line? The bar just got higher, guys. The bar just got higher. You're going to need to pick this up and you're going to need to figure out how to get over all the excuses. I don't hear from God. I don't know how to do this. I had this, that, and the other happen in my life. The bar just got very high. I'm going to tell you right now that the things I'm saying, I'm going to die for. I am going to die for what I'm doing. I know that. God has told me that. And if you don't pick up your covenant, you will not participate in that first resurrection. You will not share in it, nor will you be saved. Because at this time in history, the word tells me that all the inhabitants of the earth are going to worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. At this point in history, you will either receive the mark of the beast or the seal of the Lamb. And those who receive the mark of the beast, which is in your heart, by the way, it's not something you're going to see. It's not something you're going to be, be refusing from the outside because nothing from the outside defiles you. It's what's coming from your heart. The word tells me that anyone who receives that mark, the smoke of their torment is going to rise forever and ever. They will not have an opportunity to be saved. They will not have a second chance. And I'm going to tell you something else. I'm happy that God didn't reveal that to me until last night, that he's been talking to me about this uh, curse of bitter water that's going, that is already here, that he's been telling me to tell you for the last couple of months, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. No one listens. And now it's here. And he's not providing an opportunity for people to just scramble at the last minute. And you know what? That's biblical. Matthew 13, 15, for this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears and they've closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn, and I would heal them. We were told in Isaiah that God was going to harden those who didn't have a heart for him. Otherwise, they would turn, and he would heal them. You think he's going to have me doling out information to you, showing you these things in scripture? If you don't have a heart for him, and you want to come in at the last minute, that's not how it works. The way that I understand this from him is that that curse of bitter water has gone out on those who've been claiming to be Christian. Now he extends to the people on the street. And for those of you who remain, watch how quickly, watch how deeply, watch how intensely these people who have not known him, these people who have not pursued him, watch how quickly they turn to him. And you tell me, why is it that the pagans that he will bring in, the dejected that he will bring in, why is it that they will pursue him with more fervor than those who have been claiming to be in him? You tell me, why did the Gentiles pursue him? And the Jews, but the Jews who had been waiting on their Messiah, why did the majority of them reject him? Because you're going to know what you've been given. The people that he is going to bring in, they know their debt. They know that they cannot make what they have done right. And they're not using it as an excuse to not do the work. I cannot believe the people who have dropped off now. I can't believe it. And literally right in season with what he's been saying, right in season with what he's been telling me, that this curse is coming and that those who are insincere will be cut off. They will be hardened. I cannot believe the people who are falling right now. 
and I can't believe the, the stories I'm hearing. And they're just like my story. The stories that I'm hearing now from the people who are coming in, who are showing up, who heard the word, and they're like, not looking back. Hand to the plow, I'm showing up. The stories I'm hearing of addiction, prison time, using drugs while pregnant. These are the people who know that they have a debt. You know why God chooses them? Because they will love him more. Let me read to you. Luke 7, verse 36, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which one of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You've judged correctly, he said, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet. She wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss. But this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith is saved. You go in peace. Look, they can't even receive the rebuke. They can't even receive the, re- the reproval. Who is this who forgives sins? That's God's heart. He can clean up anyone. He wants those who are going to know what they've done in their life, who are going to know that they messed up their lives. You know how many times I say to that, to, say that to him? I messed up my life, Lord. My life is in your hands. I messed everything up. You are the only one who knows how to move me. And because I know that, I'm able to bring myself into the position that I need to be in, in order to be used by him, in order to submit to him, in order to rest in him, and in order to not pick this up by the work of my hands. And because of that weakness and that submission, his power, his glory rests on me. That is how you are going to be anointed. For those of you who keep trying to control this, by the way, you cannot control, you cannot postulate, you need to exercise self-control, step back and ask the spirit of God what you should speak. Ask the spirit of God to reveal certain things to you. There's no reason you have to speak right away. You can step back, write down your thoughts and ask the Holy Spirit to guide you. And if he is guiding you, He's going to give you the scriptures to substantiate what it is that he's saying saying to you. I'm here to help you with that. I'm here to help you to understand how to exercise self-control, how to get a hold of those compulsions and impulses, how to examine those chinks in your armor. But I also want you to know that if, when a person starts postulating in group, you're going to be called on it right away. You're going to be called on it right away because you have not heeded the warning that I'm giving you that you need to exercise prudence and self-control. And also because I'm not going to allow anyone to present a stumbling block to others in the group to engage in that kind of a process. Postulating and thinking about God has no place in the kingdom of God. You receive from him who he is and you receive from his word what is his truth. Please don't jump ahead of where God has you right now. Don't start teaching the group. I'm there to facilitate God has given me a specific role and you are you have a specific role as well but he hasn't given you a role to come into the assembly and start dominating the group. What has he said? I recently went through this in a video regarding wives who are dominating their husbands and how that presents disorder. It creates disorder in God's assembly. What do you think happens when there's a facilitator of the group that God has placed me in that position, and then another person starts trying to facilitate the group, teaching other people, postulating about things that are not in the word. Don't be doing that. I'll tell you what you can do is if God has given you a word, then speak that word. But there's no way that God has given you a word to dominate 
that is coming from a spirit of fear, from a spirit of anxiety. You have to know that because God says, I haven't given you a spirit of fear, but one of love, power, sound mind, and self-control. That is not a spirit of self-control. It is not prudence and it creates disorder in the group, in the assembly. Please don't do that. Here's the thing. I know that I reprove you guys. I reprove you guys with strict adherence to the word. And that is my job. That is my role to maintain the purity of God's word. And I have a short time to do the work that I am supposed to be doing before I leave, before I leave this earth. And if you're not feeling the urgency from this passage of scripture to get it together and to adhere to God's word, then there's a problem. You can't dilly dally and you can't let God's word roll off your back, the things that you don't want to pay attention to or you don't want to address in your life. You have a short time. I have a shorter time. And in order for you to be used, you need to listen when you're being corrected. You need to be built. And these false fleshy ways that you've been living your life need to go. This being built like this is the only thing that matters right now. It's the only thing that matters. Let me read again what we're dealing with. Let me read again what we're facing. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshiped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Now look at the timing in Revelation 19, verse 9. The timing of when the supper, wedding supper of the Lamb comes. Then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. All right, so when is this happening? Let's go ahead and read Revelation 19. After this, what's this? This is after the bowls of wrath and Babylon has fallen. This is after the resurrection, the bowls of wrath. It is before the second death and it is before the second resurrection. These are the only ones who are going to be the bride of Christ. How do we know that? Because it's talking about the wedding supper of the lamb has come. So we need to understand the timing of when this is happening. After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again, they shouted, hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne and they cried, amen, hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne saying, praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both great and small. Then I heard what sounded like a multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, hallelujah, for our Lord God almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the lamb has come. The wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. You are living during a blessed time. This is a time in which you can look back and you can see the wickedness that has happened on the earth during your lifetime. And you can say, all right, I don't know any martyrs of God, or maybe you do, maybe you know a couple, I don't know. But you have this opportunity to be martyred and become part of his bride. And here's the reason why I'm saying if you're not shouting from the roof the things he whispers in your ear, if he's not if he's not building that in you and you're just sort of flying under the radar, you think, oh, I'm going to get saved, but I, I really don't want to like put myself out there. I really don't want to exercise self-control. I really don't want to be exposed. What am I doing? Am I somehow different? No, I'm an example. I'm an example to you, a living example. You must put yourself out there. You must exercise self-control. You must speak by the spirit of God and you must learn how to pick this up and shout from the roof everything that he's whispering in your ear in a self-controlled way, which means by his spirit. 
because his spirit is what? His spirit is a spirit of self-control. So I've said in other videos, there are those who are not participating and then there are those who are over-participating who need to rein it in and wait for the spirit of God to move you. Don't make it about you. Wait for the spirit of God to move you. Wait for him to do his work. You can't be used by him if you keep trying to take this up by yourself. You can't be used by him if you're a branch that separates from the vine. You also can't be used by him if you're just a dead branch, one that hangs out because you're scared. So both of those extremes need to rein it in. So last night we read Revelation 19 and Revelation 20, and we discovered two things. One is the timing of when this is happening. This is happening after the resurrection, during the bulls of wrath. That's when the wedding supper of the lamb has come, when Babylon has fallen. Excuse me, I think I said during the bulls of wrath. This should be after the bulls of wrath when Babylon has fallen. The bride has already been decided. The bride has already been resurrected, has already gone with Christ, is dressed in fine linen, white and clean, standing for the righteous acts of God's holy people. That's God's bride. That just eliminated a whole lot of people. And it just completely changed the definition of God's bride, didn't it? How many people will be so incredibly surprised, so incredibly surprised. And there's a reason, you know, now this makes sense why, why Jesus is always, always stratifying the kingdom of heaven by saying things like, whoever does these things is going to be the least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever does these things will be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever does these things will surely never enter the kingdom of heaven. These people are going into the lake of burning sulfur. These people will be saved only as one escaping the flames. First Corinthians 3.15. Are you getting this? You have to reach a certain bar in order to be the bride of Christ. There's a huge delineation between the bride of Christ and those who are servants, only the bride of Christ, only those who've been martyred, only those who are serving in this capacity, shouting from the roofs what he whispers in their ear, exercising self-control, living by his spirit, remaining connected to the vine, picking up their cross, suffering from Christ for Christ, even unto death. Those are the only ones who will be his bride. Those are the only ones who will be adopted into sonship. If anyone is saved only as one escaping the flames, they will simply be servants of God. They will bear the consequences of their sins for having gone far from him. They will rise again in the second resurrection. They will endure the second death. When they rise, they will be given an opportunity. They will have to go through this again where Satan is unbound and goes out to deceive again but they will have no inheritance, no inheritance. Read Ezekiel 46, verse 16. This is what the sovereign Lord says. If a prince makes a gift from his inheritance to one of his sons, it also belongs to his descendants. It is to be their property by inheritance. If, however, he makes a gift from his inheritance to one of his servants, the servant may keep it until the year of freedom. Then it will revert to the prince. His inheritance belongs to his sons only. It is theirs. The prince must not take any of the inheritance of the people driving them off their property. He is to give his sons their inheritance out of his own property so that not one of my people will be separated from their property. Okay, there's a delineation. He's talking about the third temple. We're the third temple. There's a delineation between sons and servants. And in Ezekiel 44, verse 10, the Lord says, the Levites who went far from me when Israel went astray and who wandered from me after their idols, must bear the consequences of their sin. They may serve in my sanctuary, having charge of the gates of the temple and serving in it. They may slaughter the burnt offerings and the sacrifices for the people and stand before the people and serve them. But because they served them in the presence of their idols and made the people of Israel fall into sin, therefore I have sworn with uplifted hand that they may, must bear the consequences of their sin, declares the sovereign Lord. They are not to come near to me, to serve me as priests or to come near any of my holy things or my most holy offerings. They must bear the shame of their detestable practices. And I will appoint them to guard the temple for all the work that is to be done in it. Now, you need to understand, again, those living at this point in time are either going to receive the mark of the beast or the seal of the lamb. There is, you, you are either going to be martyred or you will not be saved. You are either going to pick this up or you will re not receive salvation, period. I know someone who thinks it's just enough to work with me, somehow thinks that they're going to pick this up by osmosis. They are completely wrong. It is ridiculous for them to think that they are on their way to undoubtedly being an object of God's wrath. There is no way 
that they will be saved through me. No one will be saved through me, not even my children. Ezekiel 14, 14, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they could only save themselves by their righteousness, declares the sovereign Lord. Ezekiel 14, 16, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, even if these three men were in it, they could not save their own sons or daughters. They alone would be saved, but the land would be desolate. You understand? No one's going to be saved by what I'm doing. So you need to understand very clearly, listening to my channel all day is not what's going to save you. The things that I say shepherd you back to God. I'm constantly telling you, go back to him fast. Do what you got to do. This is the only thing that matters in your life, period. Even if you think you got six years, six more years to get it together, you don't because you may not even have tonight. Return to him now. Don't delay. Don't say, oh, I got to wait till I have a day off in order to fast, in order to return to him. That's ridiculous. Return to him now. Don't put off attending his assemblies and say, oh, I have to make myself clean. I, I mean, go make yourself clean. Go return to him and then attend his assembly that he's commanded you to attend. No more excuses, guys. This just raised the bar. These are the only people who are going to be the bride of Christ. This is Jerusalem coming out of the sky. If you understand the timing of when these things are going to happen, then you understand that these are the only people. And here's the thing that you need to, you know, really consider right now is that the early church were being martyred. That was an underground movement. No one, no one, it was illegal to be Christian. People were being persecuted and killed. You saw that the apostles were hiding in a room because they were afraid. There was no synagogue for them to go to. There was no cathedral. There was no mega church. What in the world? Why do we think that we're so much better than the early church. Why do we always think that we're so much better than Jews, that we're so much better than the Israelites, that, that God somehow just, you know, sent his son to just give it all away for free? Our burden is greater than, it, than any burden has ever been. Jesus said that judgment would be on this generation. The burden would be on this generation. Peter said in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he requires everyone everywhere to repent. Why in the world would we think that we have it easier than those who went before us? It's shameful. It is shameful that we have ever believed that. We do not have it easier. He sent his son. He requires more. And we're using his son as a stumbling block? We better get it together, huh? The early church were being killed. They were being fed to animals in the arena. You understand? They were being burned at the stake to light up the towns. Paul even acknowledges, look what he says, 1 Corinthians 4, 9. He says, for it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession like those condemned to die in the arena. He's referencing it. We've been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. And you know what happened? By the time Constantine came around, Rome had been dominating with the strength of iron, right? Crushing everything underfoot. And so when papal Rome overthrew pagan Rome through Constantine setting up counterfeit Christianity, that provided a way for Christians, for counterfeit Christians who weren't willing to pick this up. It provided them a way to exit, to be able to say, oh, thank goodness, now Christianity is legal. But you know what? When they started seeing that that image had been set up, that image of the cross to the sun god Tammuz, when they saw that that had been set up, they had an opportunity to say, you know what? No, this is in opposition to what we know. This is opposite of what our God requires. They had an opportunity when Constantine, when the calendar was being changed from the Hebrew calendar that got established to the Gregorian calendar, they had an opportunity to say, no, God said that he established these things in order. How are we ever to know his appointed times if we, you know, adapt that calendar? God's people have had an opportunity this entire time to resist and reject what Satan was setting up. Just like with the second temple during um, the festival of dedication, which, you know, they call ha Hanukkah in the world. The festival of dedication is what it's called in the Bible. When the Greeks overtook the second temple, God's people had an opportunity. You know what they were doing? They were causing, they were, they were encouraging and, and forcing God's people to desecrate a Sabbath. Uh, they weren't allowed to observe Sabbath. They were burning the Torah. They were telling them to like sacrifice, you know, disgusting sacrifices to God, right? Defiled sacrifices like pigs in front of their houses to do all of these crazy things. And many and most Jews were not upset about that. They were like, you know what? You can't beat them, join them, basically. 
God's laws had been a, a burden on them. They didn't want to be separated from the world. You see that attitude constantly. We want a human king. We don't want Samuel the prophet. And that's where Hellenistic Judaism bore out of. They just adapted Greek practices. What else happened? Early 1900s, Reform Judaism, the science of Judaism. We don't, want, we don't want to have to live as a nation set apart. We want to be like the world. The science of Judaism, really? They didn't reform something else. They reformed God's word. And that's exactly what happened through counterfeit Christianity, through Catholicism. Reforming, because it was too much of a burden. It was too much of an inconvenience to pick up the cross that Jesus told us that we needed to pick up, to suffer for him, to be martyred, to be persecuted. Well, it's come full circle. Lots of false religion that was established in between, and now it's come full circle, and that burden is on us. And we are living at a time where we have that opportunity. My parents, I don't believe, had that opportunity. I don't know. Only God knows. But at this time in history, knowledge is increasing, and he has set us apart to live at this time to be given the opportunity. But we don't have a middle-of-the-road opportunity, okay? We don't have that opportunity where we would be given a second chance. We have either you're in him or you're not, period. And that bar just got really high. You are either bearing the fruit of being in him or you're not. And many of you are taking some very high risks, very high risks. If God is convicting you, you need to take him up on that now. You don't know if you have tonight. And those who are going to be the bride of Christ will undoubtedly, no question, will be martyred for Christ, period. Okay, now what I want to tell you is that when I'm reproving you, when God has me speaking in a particular way, I'm well aware that it's difficult for many of you to hear. I'm well aware that sometimes it feels embarrassing. You feel like you're exposed. I want you to understand why it is that God has me doing that because it's really not about me. It's about his heart. I have the lovely task of being a messenger, but it's about his heart. It's more important for you to be exposed now, for you to feel these feelings now so that you pick up what you need to pick up. It's more important for you to feel that fear of God right now than to feel it when you're an object of his wrath. I mean, do you really want that? So if you put it into perspective, put it into context, what I'm doing with you, what I'm saying to you, then you can understand it from the perspective of love. Then you can understand that there's not a lot of time for you to pick these things up and that the bar is so high. And now I feel better about this because I've been praying to him over the last like, you know, week or so that he's had me speaking more sternly, speaking more directly, because I have felt bad in a way. Like, I don't want to speak that way to you guys, but I have to speak the way that he burns it in me, the way that he moves me. And now, after having him show this to me, after showing me, based on Revelation 19 and, and Revelation 20, that the only people who are going to be his bride, the only people who are going to be engrafted into sonship, the only people who are going to participate, share in that first resurrection, are those who have been martyred. There's no possible way that you're going to pick that up if you're not willing to pick up what's in front of you right now. Some of the baloney that I hear people saying, oh, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. If I had money, I'd give it all the way to the poor. Really? I mean, you're not even doing that now. I mean, I've literally heard people say that who can't even handle the most minor things that happen in their life. And they think they're going to give money away to the poor. I mean, if someone just hands you money, you know, a lot of times that's what people mean and they're lying anyway. But give me a break. People who have money have worked for that money, the majority of them. They've worked in some way. They've absorbed some sort of liability. No one's going to come up to you on the street and hand you money and then you're going to go, oh, I think I'll give this to the poor. If you're not doing it now, you're not going to do it later. The most minor things are not being done now by people who claim to be in God. What makes you think that you're going to die for him? What makes you think when you're faced with that, when you're afraid that you're going to actually die for him? If you're not being moved now, you won't be moved later. So you need to think about these things. Are you in or are you out? Because nothing that you think is so important right now even matters. The only thing that matters is that you're being built right now to do the things that you need to do to function as the body, as the kingdom, as the church, to fulfill your role and to be built by him to endure what, what you have been set apart to endure. 
I want to remind you of one more thing. Remember when those two boys came to Christ and they said, well, actually it was the mother. And she said, I'd like one of my sons to sit at your right and the other to sit at your left. And he asked them, are you ready to uh, drink of this cup that I'm going to drink of? And they said, yes, right away, of course. Maybe they meant it. But I'll tell you one thing. I hear far too many Christians saying that, oh, yeah, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. They're full of it because they're not doing it now. How are you going to do it later? Not even willing to give up the most minor things. How are you going to do it later? It's a lie. Now, these young, these men, may maybe they actually meant what they were saying. Personally, having been built by God, I couldn't have even known what in the world I was saying, yes, I'm ready to do that too. He had to be, build me to understand. And part of the way he built me was by allowing the enemy to test me, to scare me about things that could happen to me and things that could happen to my family. And I had to work my heart into being willing to continue to say the things that I say, being willing to endure the things that he was showing me I would experience or could experience. You don't know how to prepare yourself. You need him to build you for the ministry and you need him to prepare you for what you're going to suffer. Please discern this message with God. Please pray about this message. This is a very, very important message.